I really like this example because it illustrates a kind of experiment that you can do easily on your own. And it also shows how, in this case, by making the imperative vocabulary stronger, follow me, or even you should follow me, we see an increase in click-through rate. The clearer you make what users ought to do, the more users click through. Ron Kohabi has been a leading expert on controlled experimentation for a number of years, and I'd like to share with you a couple of examples from his research. He's currently at Microsoft, and here's a simple example from search results that shows how imperceptible changes to an individual can aggregate to yield phenomena that you can measure. Here you can see two versions of search results, one which is slightly typographically crisper than the other one. You may not even notice the difference at all. However, this difference, which is below your conscious level, increases the uh, number of queries per user by 0.9%. And the number of ad clicks per user increases 3%. At the scale that Microsoft and the other large search players operate, this is a huge change. And I think it's a nice example of how, in general, the giant scale of experiments that you can conduct on the web makes small but consequential differences detectable. Things which we'd never see in the lab, you can now investigate. Also, it's an example of how changes which are too small to matter for a couple of people if you were building search results for 10 users, a 0.9% change might not be something you'd worry about. However, the impact of these changes accumulates when the number of users increases to the scale of the web. It is worth mentioning that some of the changes that you may see may in fact be anomalies rather than real changes. For example, aggregating results on a month-by-month -month basis may make February or shorter months seem like they were down months. In reality, they just have fewer days. Or the day that you switch to daylight savings time may see a dip in March. The day that you switch from daylight savings time, which has an extra hour, you may see an increase. So be careful about these variations, which can just be an artifact of your measuring tool. It's another reason why it's so important to run real manipulations Correlations can, of course, tell you a lot, but the manipulation helps avoid many of these data anomalies. All of the examples we've seen so far show a case where the designer intended to create a new variation and then measured the impact. And this is, that's great. It's also important to pay attention to your measurements, even for design changes that you think won't have any impact. Here's an example of a shopping cart from Greg Linden's blog where on the left we have a page that yielded a large number of conversions. On the right, what was intended to be a routine change dropped the number of conversions precipitously. Why? I'll give you a moment to think about it. Since a number of variables changed at once, it took a little bit of work to figure out which of these five design changes was the one that actually made the difference. It turns out that the, the killer difference that decreased conversion was adding a box for the coupon code. Because many people, when they see a coupon code, will then go search on the web, try to find coupons for that. A lot of those folks will never return to buy what they were just about to a moment ago. Here's an article reporting how Expedia ran into a similar problem, where by simply adding a field with company name, that had a dramatic decrease in the conversions on their website. And these changes may seem trivial, but again, at scale, they can have a dramatic impact. And I think these underscore the point that small distractions, like extra fields, can have a big impact on your site's performance. And conversely, if you get the small things right, you can have a dramatic positive impact. Here's a nice example from Ron Kohavi again. These are two versions of feedback from Microsoft Office. The difference between the two is that the first one shows both the qualitative and quantitative feedback on the same screen, stars and reason. The second one, subtly but importantly, separates them in time so that what you first see is just a number of stars and what you next see is the qualitative feedback. And shifting to this two-stage feedback doubles the response rate. But Microsoft's designers weren't done yet. They wondered whether they could increase things even more. So here's a version, we'll call this version C, and what it does is, as opposed to having five stars, we have three buttons, yes, no, and I don't know. And then 
the we have the same two-stage feedback strategy as before, except the prompt in this case is customized to the particular button that you clip. So we have uh, simplified the number of options for the feedback, and we've customized the prompt. Making these two small changes increases the rate of feedback by three and a half fold. This feedback example illustrates two important points. The first of them is a psychological principle called commitment escalation, that if you get somebody to agree to do a little bit and then add a little bit more later on, they're much more likely than if you make the big ask up front. And interfaces that get this right can reap the rewards. The second that we're seeing is that phenomena like commitment escalation are subtle and fine-tuning it to exactly your circumstances will take some work. And so what we're seeing is that by combining iterative design and controlled experimentation, you can dial in these phenomena to make your site work most effectively. By now, I bet you're really excited about the opportunity for running experiments online. And so in the next video, we'll talk about general techniques for being able to do this effectively.